to a default organization for open source projects these days. Um, uh, today, I don't have time, but we should probably uh, learn his background. He comes from a very uh, illustrious computing family that has been part of computing for all along and open source and nonprofit. But maybe that is for another day. So, Jim. Thank you, Guru. Uh, that might be for another day. He's referring to my, uh, I, I'm old enough to, for it to be weird that I come from a, a, a third generation of technology. My grandfather actually uh, worked at Control Data in Minnesota and was one of the founders of Cray Research that so worked on the first supercomputers. Uh, my dad was a lifelong computer programmer, so I'm fortunate enough to uh, be here. But my uh, background uh, that's interesting relative to uh, a Guru and what you're doing is one of my first jobs was actually at an operator. I worked at a small company called Western Wireless in the Pacific Northwest. It was uh, uh, a wireless operator, which through a series of uh, acquisitions and consolidation is now T-Mobile USA. But uh, one of the things I did was worked uh, on our CLEC, uh, Competitive Local Exchange Carrier uh, programs. And at that point, uh, the uh, central office was something we just wanted to get access to it, right, as a competitive local exchange carrier. This was in the mid-90s in deregulation. And I would have never uh, imagined that today the central office would now be uh, reimagined as a data center. I think Guru deserves a lot of thanks for having the ingenuity and the insight and imagination to really uh, rethink that critical part of uh, operators' networks. Um, and while uh, I'm glad to hear you say that uh, people might recognize my name, how many people here have actually heard of me before? See, it's not as many, it's not as many. Uh, but how many people know this guy? See, much more. That's Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. Linux is really, oh, the Linux Foundation is the home to Linux. Uh, uh, there we go. All right. Somebody asking Siri what to do? All right. There we go. All right, so everybody knows Linus Torvalds. The cadence of my joke now is completely ruined. Um, so Linus Torvalds, again, uh, incredible. How many people here know that Linus not only wrote Linux, but he wrote Git as well? Two holes in one, right? In software, this you know, first time you're lucky, second time you're good, right? Uh, this this guy is perfect. And so the my role relative to all of this, the Linux Foundation, is, is technically as the executive director, I'm Linus Torvalds' boss. That's my claim to fame. Um, but you know what? I'm also the boss of this girl. Uh, that's my eight-year-old daughter, Nisha. Um, and what's funny is she actually shares a lot in common with Linus Torvalds in my role at the Linux Foundation. Uh, they're very, very similar, in fact. Uh, they're both clearly adorable. Right? Uh, they're both genius. As a proud father, I can testify to that. My daughter is genius, but so is Linus. But the, the most important thing is neither of them listen to, to anything I say. Uh, but you know, today we heard a lot about how uh, the, uh, the operators are reimagining the central office, are creating innovative new architecture to meet the requirements of uh, broadband and streaming video and 5G networks of the future. And what I want to talk about is how to build communities in order to build the software that will indeed make that architectural vision a reality. And what we need to talk about before we get into that relative to core as an open source project is to talk about why open source is such an important way to get this job done. Open source today is uh, really redefining how any technology product or service or implementation gets delivered. You know, for a long time in the first generation of open source, open source was really just a fast follower of pre-existing kind of incumbent proprietary technology, right? You know, you had uh, a, a database, you know, the Oracle database beget a MySQL database. You, you know, uh, the My Windows operating system begot uh, Linux as a competitor, right? It was this sort of fast following uh, uh, movement. But today that has really changed. We're entering a new world where Real innovation is actually happening in open source before it's happening in proprietary uh, organizations. And in fact, open source is sort of leading, whether it's in big data, whether it's in the networking sector, like what we're talking about today. And then an economy is actually being created around these open source projects. Uh, Ping Li at, at Excel Ventures, I think, puts it really well in describing the three phases of uh, innovation today, which is project, product, profit. Right? And Cord and the Linux Foundation work on the project side, building a community, critical mass of developers around a technology, 
that then is uh, experimented with, innovated upon, and then productized either by uh, companies like AT&T and China Unicom or vendors like, you know, uh, traditional Huawei, Ben, Cisco and others uh, who all then make money off of uh, that. And that cadence now has sort of been figured out in the industry, in the open source ecosystems. And it's creating this acceleration of innovation that we're seeing, again, in all these areas of big data, cloud computing and so on and so forth. And there's a huge amount of wind at the back of open source, which is why, again, it's being adopted to solve tough technical problems, you know, here at Google and all over the industry, in that we're shifting from a sort of product world in technology at the highest level towards really a service economy in technology. And, you know, this is a somewhat old uh, quote and, you know, just kind of think of it generally. But as you move towards something like services at Google or services through an operator, services at Amazon, towards that product side of the ledger no longer being the profit center, Right? You're not making a license sale. You're not selling something physically. You're offering a subscription service. When you move technology to the cost side of the ledger, the bill of materials and so forth, open source just naturally wins, right? Because you want to lower that cost. You want to accelerate time to market. Uh, and then you make your money on an ongoing services space. So it turns out you know, AT&T, you had it right all along, right? Like the, the services model really uh, it is what works. Now, what, what also is happening is that open source is dominating almost all code because you can't build anything these days and be competitive without open source. GoPro doesn't go out and build their own kernel, right? They don't build their own operations. You know, they're only focused on the user interface and the experience of using that uh, uh, camera. Everything else underneath it is open source. Even Apple, it, how many people here have an iPhone? A few of you? Go into like general about settings, legal notices, and it's way down in, 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 the, in the phone. And then skim through the hundreds of open source components and licenses that you'll see in there. Every iPhone, you know, iPad, you know, Mac device, tons of open source. I mean, nobody makes anything these days without open source because you get to market faster. There's too much software to be written for anyone to write it themselves. The value of collective innovation you heard from Google this morning and being able to learn from peers is important. And then you focus on your unique value add where you end up spending more money. Now, what's interesting here is that companies are actually not spending less on re re research and development by federating 80% of that research and development across their partners. They're actually spending more, but they're spending more smart money on that 20% value add and then sharing that underlying cost. So that is why open source is so critical. That is why Cord as an open source project uh, is important in terms of accelerating innovation in this industry. Now let me talk a little bit about the role of the Linux Foundation relative to Cord. So we're obviously home to Linux, which is the world's largest uh, project, but we have hundreds of members all over the world many of them global operators, uh, who uh, work with us on a wide variety of open source projects. Now, the thing that's important to understand here is 650 organizations seems like a lot, but I spend every day teaching organizations about open source who are outside of that 650. You see, the key for us at the Linux Foundation is to show organizations like China Unicom, like AT&T, other global operators, how to manage open source strategically, bring open source code into their networks, share changes they make in that open source back to the open source projects, understand the legal regimes that govern those projects so that they can share intellectual property they want to share, keep the intellectual property they want to keep. That is something that will be important for the entire industry to understand those modalities. How do you manage external R&D? It's something I spend a lot of my time teaching hundreds of companies all around the world. Because open source projects like Cord have a common set of things they need to work, right? You need a governance structure and membership, right? There needs to be a central place where the shared intellectual property assets can be neutrally held in an antitrust free environment so that we can all co-create on that, right? If, if 
the assets, whether it's the trademark, the copyright, are held by a single vendor or a single entity, it doesn't work because you're not going to be able to get your fellow competitors to co-invest if at some point one entity can kind of pull the rug out from under you. And so that's why organizations like the Linux Foundation and the Ford Project exist, right? And we set up a structure where people can come in and invest. You need a clear development process. We've learned through 25 years of Linux, through standing up dozens of open open source projects, how to make technical decisions in an open source project. And there's a variety of ways to do that, but they're very similar in most cases, right? There's technical decision making, whether it's through a benevolent dictator like Linus Torvalds, who's got the final say in everything that goes into Linux, and then hundreds of lieutenants underneath him, uh, whether it's technical steering committees and so forth, we set all of that up. Cord follows those best practices for release management, technical decision making, and so forth. There's an infrastructure required, right? A set of uh, tools that allow people to uh, basically collaborate at scale. Somebody mentioned Kubernetes this morning. So we host Kubernetes at the Linux Foundation. Uh, we partner in uh, our Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, with Google and a wide variety of companies. You know, the biggest uh, difficulty that Kubernetes has right now is that the number of pull requests and bug fixes coming into that project is accelerating at such a rapid pace that the development community is just having a hard time keeping pace with that. Now, the kernel community has been working on this for 25 years. The kernel changes eight times an hour. 10,000 lines of code are added and 5,000 lines of code are subtracted from the Linux kernel every single day. It's just an insane, when you really think about it, anyone who's in software development, just, it, it, it blows me away every time I hear about it. And that's the kind of infrastructure we're providing Cord, we're providing things like Kubernetes in order to scale and accelerate that even faster. And then the next thing that's important that we're working with Guru and the Cord project and others on is ecosystem enablement. Ecosystem enablement is a polite way to say marketing to developers who hate marketing. But it turns out that marketing actually matters in open source. In order to create that project critical mass, you need to have ecosystem development, marketing events to get more developers to the table. That is what we intend to do with the core project is to be able to create all of the resources so that we can easily attract new developers into the project so that we can help grow a support community. You heard China you know, just now say, we don't have enough vendors who support this. Well, part of the ecosystem enablement is enabling and recruiting that community in. And then finally, intellectual property management. How to share what you want to share and keep what you want to keep. Our industry, the whole tech sector, is built on concepts of intellectual property monetization, sharing, and so forth. And open source licenses are just no different than any other form of uh, sharing intellectual property. You just need to understand how to do that correctly, how the licenses interact with each other in order to maximize the amount of shared code uh, and provide opportunity for monetization around, below, on top, beside, however you want to do it. And we have a whole group that manages that. And so we're home to dozens and dozens of projects from, uh, as I mentioned before, Kubernetes. We uh, have a Let's Encrypt project, which is looking to uh, uh, basically secure the entire internet. May It's a free certificate authority. It's now actually the world's largest certificate authority, trying to make HTTPS the default for the entire internet. Uh, Node.js, uh, we have uh, unmanned aerial vehicle projects, we have IoT initiatives, we have uh, cloud computing, automotive initiatives, you name it. Um, and this is producing tremendous economic value. If you look at how much software, and this is an old statistic that's probably inaccurate and has grown considerably since now, you know, when I look at something like Cord and just measure what it would take for any single organization to create a code base like this, it just can't get done. Billions of dollars of value are being created here. So if you think about what's going on at the Linux Foundation, we've got all these projects up and down the stack. Right? And this is just a, a, a sample representation. This isn't meant to be definitive in any way. And I think this is interesting. And this will give you an idea of kind of how Cord can fit into this. If we uh, fit Cord in here in some way, that's interesting too. But what's more interesting to me, and Guru and I have talked a lot about this, isn't just each individual project having all the things that I just described necessary to make the open source project successful. It's how do we make all of those projects more secure? 
how do we create a set of secure coding practices in all open source projects to do things like fuzzing, do better static analysis, have responsible disclosure policies, uh, have uh, all of those projects trained in threat modeling, teach developers how to write more secure code in the first place is something the Linux Foundation is spending millions of dollars on in order to make every open source project on the internet more secure by teaching developers how to write secure code in the first place. This fall, we're hosting an event at the White House working with the Obama administration on helping to apply these practices again to everyone. And it's not just security. How do you do better governance, operations, and ecosystem development across these projects so that we can grow them more quickly? How do you share the best practices of the kernel community with new projects like Cord? How do you do licensing and IP management that works? Not only that works in terms of managing intellectual property, but allows these projects to inform each other of how to allow code to flow across them, right? Because some open source licenses aren't compatible with other open source licenses. And if you don't look at your adjacent projects to understand which ones might be important to integrate and you get the license choice wrong, you kind of shut the door to interoperating or you know, pulling some of that code in. And so we want to share those practices across all of these projects. And then finally, training and certification. Again, just the previous speaker teed this up perfectly. One of the challenges uh, he mentioned was the lack of skills, right? We see this all the time at the Linux Foundation. You have this huge developer momentum, right? The industry starts to adopt this code, but there are no skilled practitioners who actually know how to deploy this at scale, right? You still have, you know, network admins who know uh, a Cisco CLI, Cisco CLI, and they, they don't know how to manage a new SDN NFV enabled world. We have to train them or it's going to be, ye we, we might have a great, technical solution here, but it will be years before that gets deployed because there's just simply not enough people to deploy that. Um, and so we're working on all these things in networking. And we've got already a variety of projects at the Linux Foundation in the networking sector, but we're really excited about Core. Now I know we're running behind, so I'm gonna quickly wrap up with a few challenges I'd like you all to think about today. And we're at the Linux Foundation here to work with Guru, the Core project, to help with these. And those challenges just quickly uh, are going to be what I already described. Training is going to be a bottleneck in core and every single network function virtualization, SDN, management and orchestration, data planes, any of these, as we move towards this new network, I'm telling you training and certification is going to be a big bottleneck. Here's some ideas about how we can solve it. And we've been doing this in Linux for quite some time. We have to create a funnel to drive training through and allow people to retool their careers into this new paradigm, right? It starts with offering free massive open online courses. We have a partnership with edX, which is the Harvard MIT partnership to allow uh, people to take free uh, courses from those universities. We're one of the non few non-academic institutions that provides uh, this kind of courseware. You then take that free learning and provide self-paced e-learning anywhere, anytime, so people can come in and learn these skills, whether it's through something that's mandated by their employer or something that people just do themselves. Classroom red training. We have an online certification and testing program that we've rolled out for cloud computing uh, practitioners, for Linux certified administrators, that allows companies and organizations to have an engineer come in gives them a set of things to just go and deploy, and then it's a real-time way that they have to go and prove that they can do that. It has to be anytime, anywhere, in order for people to prove that they have the skills to fit the bill. This is something that we really are excited about doing in the SDN and NFE space. Guru and I have discussed this quite a bit because, again, there's this big bottleneck in terms of skills to enable all this technology. Events is another thing we want to focus on. You know, uh, one of the things that you may have noticed is the Linux Foundation worked with Guru to uh, uh, take over the management of the Open Networking Summit. We think this is a great place to gather the industry. And I want to be clear about why events are important to the Linux Foundation. We're not an event management company. Fifteen years ago, we decided events were important because if Linus and all his folks uh, if, if they're left to duke it out on a mailing list, it's going to take like a year. But if you get them to an event, they actually make decisions, right? 
OpenSSL recently was a good example where uh, after Heartbleed, we uh, had the OpenSSL community meet for the first time ever. It's like a 20 year old open source project, clearly they had issues. They made decisions about architecture, about refactoring that code, about bug, uh, bug fixes and so forth quickly. And we got to do that, this at every level. And this, you know, these, these are just sort of random picks of projects, but big events like ONS, let's consolidate these so that developers don't have to go to 50 events a year. I mean, you're like, I'm sure all your frequent flyer points are doing great, but you're also probably fatigued and your family's mad at you. We should do community-specific events, hackathons, local user groups. All of these are going to be challenges. All of these things are going to be important. The final thing, and then I'll, I'll wrap up here, that is going to be a challenge for this industry is the intersection of open source and standards, right? What's happening here is that standard setting and open source are sort of converging. And uh, what's happening is that there's a huge demand to get technology to market quicker to essentially provide a reference implementation along with some form of specification and it's accelerating the number of big open source projects out there in the market it just you can literally see this sort of shift happening in the industry where you have fewer open standards consortia launch and you have more of projects like cord being launched over time and the key thing for, in particular, the networking industry to understand here is that these things are not mutually exclusive. That uh, the standards development component of this industry is very important to work in conjunction with open source development. And we really care about this at the Linux Foundation. You know, open source developers think, uh, or open source developers from a standard setting perspective uh, is sort of the wild, wild west. These guys don't care about intellectual property. They don't care about uh, standardization, about consistency. This is how open source folks think about standards professionals. Uh, but the reality is that we need both. And uh, this is something that Guru and the Core Project and the Linux Foundation are going to work with standards bodies to help the intellectual property regimes, the uh, confidentiality requirements of the SDOs intersect with open source, right? One is less confidential, fast moving. One is more confidential, perhaps more thoughtful and uh, slower moving purposely. We can do better by innovating in both. I am personally working with large standards development organizations to help sort of normalize that interaction. There's also going to be, uh, and I'm just going to go through this, um, there's also going to be times where we're going to discover across all these networking projects, standardization opportunity, common data modeling, network definitions. And we might spin up new uh, standards development efforts as a result. That's the beauty of having all these projects uh, working together. So I won't bore you with all the details on why standard settings matters, but obviously since I spent a, a bit of time on it, uh, it's something we all need to pay attention to. Here's my predictions for 2016, 2017. I think open source uh, orchestration technology is going to be a, a, a big part of growth in the networking sector. I think we'll see a little consolidation. I mean, you can't have 50 management orchestration projects out there. At some point, you'll see a little consolidation uh, as these projects sort of uh, grow and prove themselves and perhaps merge together. Data analytics, I think uh, Al Blackburn uh, pointed out that data analytics is going to be uh, an important part of this ecosystem. I think you're going to see more open source projects uh, focused on network analytics, big data, and, and, and helping in this area as well. Uh, we think that uh, there will be a lot of commercial support organizations that spring out of these open source projects. Open source projects tend to be uh, the, the market that happens before this productization happens. So you know, as Cord accelerates, there will be meaningful commercial opportunities for insurgents, for incumbent vendors, for service providers, et cetera. And we think that'll develop in 2017 and it'll provide that support that uh, operators are looking for. So we're here to help. Guru, I'm very excited about and congratulations on, on this uh, event and the launch of Cord as a, an independent project. Uh, and if there's anything uh, I can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think I'm not even going to say whether you have any questions <laughs> because we are running way behind. So thank you, Jim. Really appreciate it. So guys uh, or folks, we have a difficult choice here. 
Uh, I know uh, everybody needs a break, uh, but we really ran through the break. So my recommendation is to go to the most, actually from the open source project point of view, the most important presentation that are the next one, that is where Larry is going to talk about the platform software, and then we're going to have a presentation about the uh, use cases.